بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما أما بعد سائلة تقول أستيقظ متأخرة أحيانا فأتسحر والمؤذن يؤذن للفجر ثم أشرب الماء بعد قول المؤذن الله أكبر فهل علي عادة الصيام لهذه الأيام مع العلم أني لا أدري كم عدد هذه المرات There is a sister who says Sometimes I wake up a little late And I begin eating suhoor and the Mu'addin is calling the Adhan for Salat al-Fajr. I'm drinking or eating, and the Mu'addin is making the Adhan. So therefore, while he makes the Adhan, I continue to drink water. After he said, Allahu Akbar, after he began his Adhan. So therefore, do I have to make up these days in which I did this? Keeping in mind, or keeping in mind the fact that I lost count how many days in which this happened. Al-Jawab, the answer says, صومها صحيح إن شاء الله وليس عليها عيادة لأن هذا كان مع الأذان أو قريبا من الأذان والله عز وجل يقول وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر وفي مثل هذه الحالة لا يتضح تماما طلوع الفجر شيخ محمد ابن عبد الله السبيل رحمه الله May Allah's mercy be upon him says إن شاء الله her fast is valid إن شاء الله her fasting is sound. Now, the Shaykh didn't say that her fasting has been accepted by Allah. Whereas we've explained in many lessons before, the difference between acceptance and between validity. They're not the same. And many people get a little confused between these two things. On Hajj, they come and say, Well, Allah accept my Hajj if I did this. Is my Hajj accepted if I came late? I went to Mina, I went to Arafah, I didn't this. The, the sheep, I didn't slaughter myself. Is my Hajj accepted? We say first and foremost, Allahu A'lam, I don't know if my hajj is accepted, let alone yours. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وسلم, to say in the Quran, لا أدري ما يفعل بي ولا بكم. Allah said, say O Muhammad وسلم, I don't know that which will be done to me or you. So therefore it's a very important principle for the Muslim to understand. We have validity and then we have acceptance. We have impermissibility. And then we have validity. They are not attached and tied together. In other words, if a woman makes hajj and she doesn't have a mahram, whereas the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the correct version of the hadith is that a woman is not allowed to, who believes in Allah in the last day is not allowed to travel without a mahram. As for three days, so on and so forth, stop at a basic point. She is not allowed to travel unless she has a mahram. So if a woman leaves Philadelphia, she doesn't have a mahram, she performs hajj. Is her hajj valid? It's valid. Her hajj is valid. But she disobeyed the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu says she cannot travel without a mahram. She traveled without a mahram. So is her hajj valid, Khalid? It's valid if she performed the rest of the conditions and the rest of the obligatory acts. In other words, she may receive a sin for traveling without a mahram, but it has nothing to do with her hajj. So we say that her, hal, her hajj bidn Allah is valid. Question, Khalil, is her hajj accepted by Allah because she disobeyed the Prophet? Allah huwa. Allah knows best. Because maybe something else that she did wrong, something in her heart or his heart, which we don't know about. So in Islam, we have a difference between validity and then we have a difference between acceptance. We have a difference between impermissibility and we have a difference between validity. Also, if there's a difference, Abu Bakr, بين الوجوب وبين الإجزاء. It's a difference between something being obligatory and something being valid. We explained this a couple of days ago in uh, Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn, which we explained a couple of years ago before that. However, we wanted to refresh the brothers with the information is that there are conditions for fasting being wajib. And then there are conditions for the fast to be valid. In other words, if an eight-year-old child fasts, it's not wajib upon him. He's not wajib. But is it valid? We say 
The eight-year-old child's hot fasting could be valid, but a four-year-old child, his or her fasting may not be valid. Because they, there's another difference. We can go even further now. We have bulugh, and then we have tamiz. We have reaching the age of puberty in Islam, and then we have reaching the age of discernment. And there's a difference. So the student of knowledge, khalil, talab ilm, is the one who's always on top of all of these differences. And the, the harder you study, and the more intelligent that you are, the easier it is to split and to separate. And to put this here, and to put that there. As for the person who hasn't studied thoroughly, or cannot get the point, he's going to mix, he's going to jumble. You made hajj without a mahram, your hajj is false. You made a hajj without a mahram, Allah won't accept your hajj. How do you know? If she did everything she was supposed to do, and avoided that which she was supposed to avoid. In other words, you drive to the masjid in a stolen car. It doesn't mean that your prayer is invalid. You get sin for stealing the car or riding in it. doesn't mean it has something to do with your direct worship. Everybody clear on this? So the shaykh, rahimahullah, he says that inshallah, and look, and look at another benefit that we get from the people of knowledge. He says, inshallah, he says her fast is valid. He didn't say it decisively with all determination. He said, inshallah. In other words, even if he knows, based off of the Quran and the sunnah, there's still an adab with Allah. There's an adab with Allah. You have respect and humbleness. Because you're making a fatwa on behalf of Allah's rulings. Allah told us in the Quran, لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامَ InshaAllah. Allah says, indeed. Listen to this. لَتَدْخُلُنَّ Allah says, indeed you will enter the Masjid al-Haram. InshaAllah. Allah Himself said that. Aminin. He says, you'll be safe. محلقين رؤوسكم أو Allah says either shaving your heads or trimming your heads. In other words, Allah mentioned that to teach his slaves for tabarruk, seeking blessings and mentioning Allah's name and being humble. Inshallah, this is the haq bi idhnillah. It doesn't mean that it's doubt. It doesn't mean that I'm unsure, but it's a respect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have adab with Allah azza wa jal. Well, we don't. He says, thirdly, there isn't anything that she has to do. She doesn't have to make up her fast. Why? Now, we have three main styles of giving a fatwa according to the rightly guided predecessors. Three thalathat asalib. Three styles of giving a fatwa. And that's another issue. What is a fatwa? We can't get into that right now, but we have three styles. The first style is to mention the ruling, then mention the proof, as the sheikh did here. The second style is to mention the proof, then mention the ruling. Okay? Qala Rasulullah sallallahu the Messenger of Allah said so on and so on and so forth, therefore it's valid or invalid. And the third style is to mention the ruling without mentioning the proof. And the fourth style, if you want to go even further, is to mention the proof without mentioning the ruling. Everybody understand this? How many styles do we mention, Khalil? Four. Number one. Ruling, then the proof. What's the ruling on prayer and sitting, sitting in a chair? It's permissible to pray sitting in a chair. The proof is the Prophet ﷺ's statement. Pray standing if you can. If not, then sitting down. Number two. The proof, then the evidence. Uh, the, proof, the proof, then the ruling. Shaykh, I have to sit down when I offer the prayer. What is the ruling? The Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, narrated by Imran ibn Hussein, pray standing if you can. If not, then sitting down. If not, then lying down. Your prayer is valid. The third way. Yeah. There you go. You can pray sitting down. Next question. Fourth way. La. Fourth way. The proof only. Ha huh? Dawood. The Prophet sallallahu He said, "Pray standing if you can. If not, then pray sitting down." Khalas. These are the four main styles of fatwa among the rightly guided predecessors. So, which style did the Sheikh use here? Muhammad ibn Abdullah Subayil. Ahsan. The first one. He mentioned the the hukum. Then he mentioned the delil. He says, this is because she drank water along with the adhan, or qariban min al adhan, short period after the adhan began. And Allah the Mighty and the Majestic, He says, eat and drink until the white thread becomes clear to you from the black thread of fajr. He says, and during these types of circumstances, it wasn't 100% clear when the thread was distinct from the next thread. In other words, the mu'adhan just made the adhan. Okay, if somebody gets up late, they may be a little off balance. They eat, oh, subhanAllah, look at the clock, bismillah. They hear the adhan, the date is in their mouth, the water is in their mouth. Or maybe the adhan is a little early. Or maybe the prayer schedule is a little behind. Okay, he then says, MashaAllah, knowledge is for everyone. 
Uh, Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, Sidistani, he took his young son and he sat him with one of the biggest muhaddithin in Basra. And this muhaddith, he had a rule. He says, yani, that the murdan, beardless boys or young men couldn't sit in the circle. If you were too young, you couldn't sit and take hadith from him. So what did they do? They say that he put a fake beard on his son's face. <laughs> Literally. He put hair on his face. And he sat him down in the majlis. In other words, for him to get that rare experience of hearing from a great sheikh at such a young age. So knowledge is for everybody. Bidnillah <laughs> Azul Jalla. Tayyip? Inshallah, you be my students, inshallah. Huh? Uh, Allah Akbar. <laughs> he says here, um, وَوَرَدَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ Another proof is the hadith that says, إِذَا سَمِعَ أَحَدُكُمُ النِّدَاءَ وَالْإِنَاءَ عَلَى يَدِهِ فَلَا يَضَعْهُ حَتَّى يَقْضِيَ حَاجَتَهُ مِنْ رَوَهُ أَحْمَدُ وَأَبُ دَاوُدَ وَالْبَيْحَقِي وَالْحَاكِمُ وَصَحَهُ وَوَافَقُهُ الذَّهَبِ Another evidence is the hadith that says, when one of you hears the call to the prayer, and he has the cup up to his mouth, he shouldn't put down the cup until he drinks the necessary amount of water that he wishes to drink. This hadith is created by Imam Ahmed, Abu Dawood al-Bayhaqi, al-Hakim, and al-Dhahabi rahimahullah declared it to be sahih along with al-Hakim. Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Subayyil, he then says, وَأَنْصَحُ الْمُؤَذِّنِينَ أَنْ يَلْتَزِمُوا مُؤَذِّنًا وَاحِدًا فِي كُلِّ بَلَدٍ يَكُونُ مَسْؤُولًا وَمَعْرُوفًا بِأَنَّهُ يُؤَذِّنُ عَلَىٰ أَوَّلِ الْفَجْرِ وَهَذَا أَوْلَىٰ مِثْلُ مَا هُوْ مَوْجُودٌ فِي مَكَةَ الْآن فأذان الحرم مضبوط ومتحقق من والناس يستمعون إلى الإذاعة فإذا سمعوه أذن المؤذنون في جميع مساجد مكة تبعا للحرم يعني على أول وقت تماما وبالله توفيق He says, so therefore I advise all of the muaddins to stick to one muaddin يعني in every country In other words, one strict, accurate, precise muaddin They hear it on a radio station they get, and then they go off of him. They go off of him. Now, and of course, there's some things in America that are either impossible or very difficult. And some things are flat out just abandoned and forgotten. Some things in America we cannot do. Whether it's based off of the government, based off of the politics, based off of the space between the masjids. But there are many things that we can do. But the Muslims have become so split up, so separated, so divided so far from their deen that it becomes as if it's impossible. An example of this is Jumu'ah. When you study the concept of Jumu'ah, is it permissible to make more than one Jumu'ah in one city? You find that the people of the past were very harsh in this issue, extremely harsh. Many of them said it is invalid to have two Jumu'ahs in one city. Invalid, period. You can't do it. Some of them said if there's Distance between the masjids, if a masjid is too small, then inshallah it's okay. But they still were harsh. In other words, in Philadelphia, no one is going to say in their right mind, all the Muslims have to pray one Jumu'ah. It's too many Muslims. Not a big enough place. But there lies no doubt. In this radius, there are five masjids. In this part of Philadelphia, there are three masjids. In this block, so on and so forth, there are some things that can be eliminated. Everybody understand this point? There are some things that you can eliminate. Okay, so anything that's from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, if it goes back to personal comfort, if it goes back to personal desires and differences, those things should be thrown away in order to fulfill and to complete the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And indeed we have a good example in Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, in which he offered the prayer during the Hajj in the uh, holy city of Mecca. And Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, who Arda was the Khalifa at the time. Uthman made four raka'at. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu prayed four raka'at behind him. When he got back to his tent, the students of Ibn Mas'ud, they said, oh, yeah, I need a teacher. How, how could you pray four raka'at? And the Prophet sallallahu only made two. Every time the Prophet traveled, he shortened his prayers, Abdul Radud. And not at once did the Prophet make four raka'at on a journey. Ebedin. He always shortened his prayers. So they asked him, like, how could you do this? Ibn Mas'ud, he told his students, he says, I hate to differ with the Khalifa. He says, because all differing is evil. It's evil. Okay? And there lies no doubt when we talk about differing and the etiquettes of differing from the most important ways of coming together and avoiding differing is that you have to be willing to put down your weapon. You have to be willing to put down your weapon. We say, we want Islah. We want the people to be together. The people of the Sunnah to be together. That's what everybody wants. But you have a gun to my face saying, Islah, peace. 
Well, Lawyer, that's not going to happen. If I continue to talk about you, Shaq, Shaq is Kether, he's this, he's that. He has gray hair in his beard, he's Thob, Kether, or Kether. So, yeah. But I say, uh, let's make Islah, Yaqi. We need to come together. We shouldn't be different on these things. So stop talking about me then. <laughs> right or wrong? It's a reality. It's a reality. When somebody wants peace, there's a way to get peace. See what we can do together upon the Sunnah of the Prophet. But if I'm on the offense, if I'm attacking you, and I say I want Islah, what's that, Abu Hanif? It's a show. Pump fake, as we say in Philly. Pump fake. It's a show. So we, this is a reality, Ikhwan. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he did something that he didn't feel too comfortable with. His students repudiated him for doing that. But it was a bigger maslaha, it was a bigger benefit. Okay? And he didn't want any more people to talk about Uthman radiallahu anhu. There were enough people that were talking about him. Uthman is this, Uthman is kada, Uthman didn't do this right. He didn't need no one to see Ibn Mas'ud going against Ibn, uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu. So back to the fatwa. The sheikh says, So I advise the mu'adhins to stick to one adhan in every single country or city or town. Uh, and to make the adhan at the beginning of the time, such as is done in the city of Mecca when the sheikh was alive. Because we can precisely gauge... And yani, estimate the adhan according to the haram's adhan. Uh, and that was the, he says, and, and this is the end of the sheikh's fatwa. This here was a side benefit. Nothing to do with the topic of our talk. Yani, the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran, yufaqihu fi deen. He said, whoever Allah wants good for, he gives them fiqh of the religion. Now, before we go on, brothers and sisters, we need to do two things. First thing is, we had uh, a couple of questions from the 130 session. A question from one of the sisters and a question from one of the brothers. Secondly, we need to make review of what we took on Thursday. Raise your hand if you were here on Thursday. Thursday afternoon. Kenyatta, who else was here on Thursday? Taya. Anybody else? Khair. Right hand of the salam or left hand? Abu Bakr. Which hand did we raise? Always the Yameen. Never the left hand. Taya. Khair, inshallah. Wednesday or Thursday? Thursday. 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 That's good. Always stick with your yaqeen. If you're doubtful, if you're doubtful, then listen to what the people say. When the imam stands up and he makes an extra raka'ah, if he's doubtful and they say, subhanallah, he should sit down. If he's not sure. But if he says, no, I'm right. They don't know what they're talking about, then he must continue his prayer, even if he is wrong. Because he has yaqeen that he must follow. That's another issue. If you believe something in your heart and you're sincere to Allah, you have to follow that thing, no matter what the people say. If you have doubt, then that's a different that's a different issue. Tayyip. So are you willing to rile on this? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> 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 Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Khair. Wednesday, we were in New York City. <laughs> and Bedford, uh, Best Eye. Right. Jazakallah Khair, wise man. Okay, the question from the sisters was, we spoke about the men's attire in Islam. The clothes that a man is allowed to wear. What did we mention in brief? What did we say with regards to the rules of clothing in Islam for men? What did we mention in brief, Ikhwan? Who was here? Fadl, what do we say? Not to wear pure silk. You can wear any fabric you like. Cotton, linen, this and that. As long as it isn't what? As long as it isn't what? Pure silk. What did we say? We said pure silk. Someone could come behind us and they could understand that if it's a blend, different issue. If it's a blend, then it's what? Different issue. We said he cannot wear pure silk. 100% silk or the majority of the fabric should not be silk. As many of the companions of the Messenger of Allah wore garments that were blended. Many of them. Kathir. They called Thiyab al Khaz or Khaz. They wore garments that were mixed with silk, but they were not pure silk. Five. Number two. What else do we mention? These are called Dawabit. Sheikh Habib. We, call, we have Asl and then we have a Dawabit. These are general guidelines. These, these are the bounds to stay in. You can run any part of the field you want as long as you don't. Go out of bounds. That's the first boundaries. It can't be pure silk. It cannot be musbil. Your garment should not and cannot go beneath your ankles. It should not go beneath your ankles. Pants, thobe, 
is our unless it is a necessity, unless it's a necessity or an extreme hardship, an extreme difficulty to have your lower garment above your ankles, it should not fall beneath your ankles. We didn't get into the details of the khilaf, of the ulama, this and that. We said, it doesn't go beneath the ankles. I sent. The third boundary is what? It shouldn't be solid red. As we mentioned, some of the people of knowledge, such as Ibn Qayyim, huh? he said that solid red is haram for men to wear. Number four, that was what you hear earlier. I need only what I gave. Fadl. It should not imitate the specific clothing to women. Because there's some things that could be unisex in Islam. But that which is specific, pay attention to the words, specific. A Muslim man is not allowed to wear in any circumstance unless it's absolute necessity. Number five. Did we mention five or four? Abdullah. You mean? Shouldn't be tight and revealing. Tight. I sent. Good. What's meant by tight? Khair. Number six. Did we mention a sixth boundary? That was it. So in other words, as a Muslim man, there are a few other things which we're not going to get into. We're just going to stick with that right now. You can wear whatever you want. Izar, thobe, pants, suit, dashiki, shawar, kameez, a turban, a vest, whatever you wish to wear, as long as it doesn't fall under those six things. It's not pure silk, it's not pure, so on and so forth. As for women, then this is a similar ruling. The Muslim woman is allowed to wear any type of hijab, any color, any style, any fabric, as long as it doesn't go against the following points. The first point that it must cover her entire body, except for that which Allah made an exception to. Except for that which Allah excluded. What did Allah exclude? Hands of the face, one eye, two eyes, her height, her width, small, big, petite, difference of opinion among the Sahaba. We say every part of her body has to be covered except for what Allah excluded. You with me, Jafar? All of her body must be covered. Except for what Allah excluded. In other words, if the scholars, if the Sahaba, of the, if the Sahaba, if they never said that the forearms are from ma zahra minha, that which is plain and apparent, no one can come behind and say it's okay to have your forearms out. They differed in a few things, and it's a very important principle for the student of knowledge. If the pious predecessors differed on two opinions, it is impermissible for us to come and make a third opinion. We stay in the boundaries of their khilaf. We stay in the boundaries of their khilaf. They said that the verse means one of three things. We don't come and say it means a fourth thing. La, la, abidin. We stay in their khilaf. So therefore, if they said that hands in the face or the height of a woman, it's become clear as Umar radiallahu anhu says, Allah arafnaki ya soda. He says, we know who you are, soda. She was a large woman. We know who you are. That was apparent. Regardless whether that was before or after the hijab. Al-Muhim, he knew from her silhouette the size of that woman. If that's not the case, then you cannot expose any other part of your body. Not your knees, your legs, your neck, this or that. Except for what the ulama said, Allah had excluded. Some of those sahaba said, hands and face. Other of them said, her size, so on and so forth. Number two, the garment is not to be tightly fitted. It is not to be tightly fitted. And many women, they make a mistake. And they think that if my skin is covered, it's okay to be tight. And that's wrong. Many people, they wear tight shirts, tight pants. They have a tunic top on. It covers their behind and their legs, their thighs. But all of this is tight. La. Everything that must be covered is to be loose. With exceptions to socks. With exceptions to socks. Okay? If a Muslim sister had a hijab, and the hijab didn't cover her feet and she wore socks, that's a different issue. As Sheikh bin Baz Rahim al-Tala explained in detail. Tayyip. Number three, the garment is not allowed to be perfumed on any circumstance. Lotion, oil, anything that gives off a smell is haram to wear outside. If you wear lotion and it doesn't smell, that's one thing. If it wears off from your house, you go outside, that's one thing. But if you go outside and it has a smell, it is impermissible for a woman to wear outside of her house. Tayyip, what number are we doing, Khalid? Three, number four. The, her, the garment of the Muslim woman is not to be a means of infatuation. It's not to be a means of fitna, as we mentioned explained earlier today. What fitna means, huh? in detail. Tayyip, the word fitna is not something that pulls men to her, or women. And that term is subjective to time and place and taste and culture. Some brothers may like black. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Some may be attracted to blue or white. That's subjective, relative from man to man. 
But in general, it shouldn't be something that is out and loud. And many sisters, they fall into this. Many sisters, they fall into this. They wear something that is bright and attractive, and it pulls somebody to look at them. Okay? And then there are some people that say, well, if a sister wears black, or if she wears blue, or she wears brown, or if she has on a niqab, men are going to look at her too. Right or wrong? Men are going to be attracted to her. They're going to, and that's true. But yeah, akhi, when they look at her, what are they going to see? Loose garments or tight and fitting? Loose. So we say, yeah, I need that statement is weak. That's weak. Because if, no doubt, living in America, she walks down the street with a hijab, people are going to look at her. They're going to stare, but they can't see anything. You understand? But if she has on bright colors or a style or fabric or a brocade, and then they look at her, and it's tight and revealing, then it's the, huh, the, the clay or the, huh, is even, yeah, I need more soggy, as the Arabs say. Is that the clean billetan? Uh, it makes it even more, it's, it's even worse. Tell you. Number five, the Muslim woman's garment must not resemble the specific clothing of men. Number six, the Muslim woman's garment must not resemble the clothing of non-Muslim women. That which is specific to them, their dress. Okay, that which only a sinful non-Muslim woman would wear outside. Outside, Ikhwan. Taib? This is important. It's important. Wahim, yeah. It's important. Taib, because someone may misunderstand this. Okay? Taib. And another condition, Taib, we'll stop there. So therefore, we say in brief, any garment that you want to wear, sister, green, brown, blue, black, gray, this and that, that's your own discretion. If you want it to be of this fabric, of this pattern, of this style, as long as it doesn't fall under, violate those basic rules, then you're allowed to wear it. Okay? There's no condition that a garment has to be black. Ever then. Ever then. It's not a condition. See through? Type. The garment, of course, it shouldn't be sheer. It shouldn't, a person should not be able to look through and see the color of her skin through her garments. Type. If that's not the case, then a woman is to wear what she likes to wear. As long as it doesn't violate those main broad points. And inshallah, that should give a pretty sound, wholesome picture to it. Your garment is a means of protection, of covering. It's not a means of displaying yourself. Okay? Inshallah, that's in brief. Um, if you want more details on this, I would advise you to go back to a video that we did in Masjid Taqwa about three summers ago. You can find it on YouTube called The Hijab of the Muslim Woman. The Hijab of the Muslim Woman. Type that in. I think the page is Abu Bakr... Uh, which one? Salafi or Muslim? Muslim? Inshallah? You sure? Or... <laughs> Khair. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> huh? You, no, honestly, I'm not saying this just because of my video, but we explained it in detail. It's called the Hijab of the Muslim Woman on Abu Bakr Muslim's YouTube channel. Khair, inshallah. Moving on. There was a question from one of the brothers with regards to bid'ah. And what is, or is there such thing as bid'ah hasana? Is there such thing as a good bid'ah? And some people, some Muslims, learn it or ignorant. Hayak Allah Qasim. Allah. They say what? That Umar radiallahu anhu, when he saw the companions praying together, he says, Ni'mal bid'ah tu hadihi. He says, what an excellent bid'ah this is. What a great bid'ah. And he used this proof to say there's good bid'ah in Islam. Or on the spin side, what is the ruling on praying tarawih in your house? Should a person come to the masjid? Or should a person uh, go and pray in his house? First and foremost, we say that the term bid'ah in the Arabic language comes from three letters. Try literal or letter, uh huh. Root. Bada'ah. Ba del ain. Bada'ah. And bada'ah literally means to create something, to introduce something, to bring something anew, something that didn't exist. Ma kana ala ghayri mithalin sabiq. Something that's new and revolutionary. That's what the term literally means. That's what the term linguistically means. Bada'a. Okay? That's when you say badir. Something that's marvelous. In other words, it's so outstanding that it's like nothing came before this person. He's so major. It's marvelous, a marvel. Linguistically, it's the linguistical understanding of the term. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Badi'u samawati wal ard. Allah is the badir. Of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the badir of the heavens and the earth. Okay? In other words, Allah created the heavens and the earth without any... Huh? Without any precedent. There was nothing like the heavens and the earth before Allah created 
heavens and earth. That's the linguistical meaning. Allah says in another surah in the Quran, "Kul ma kuntu bid'an min al-rusul." Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I am not a bid'un of the rusul. In other words, there were messengers who came before me. I'm not a bid'ah. I'm not something new. Allah sent men to their people. So this is the linguistical definition of the term bid'ah. As for in Islam, and yani brothers and sisters, this is crucial to understand the term in Arabic and then understand it legislatively and understand how it is applied. Because many people, they fall into error on both sides. Everything is a bid'ah because they have an improper understanding of it. Nothing is a bid'ah. There's good bid'ah because they have an improper understanding of it. We say that the bid'ah in Islam, tariqatun, Mukhtara'atun First part of the most comprehensive definition Is that it is a manner A style A way A practice That is new First condition That it has to be new Mukhtara'a Huh? Tariqatun Mukhtara'atun Something that is new Okay? Yuslaku Bissuluki alayha At-taqarrub ilallahi azza wa jal Tudahi shari'iyya Tudahi, al-sharia, al-shari'iyya. Something that is new, a person does it, ha yuqsadu bis suluki alayha al-mubalagatu fi taqarrub ila Allah. Some ulama say. A new way that a person only does to go extreme, to go beyond and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting more rewards. I want to go further. The hadith says this, the sunnah stops there, I want more. And this tariqa, this way or this method, Huh? It tudahi, it imitates and it resembles the sharia or the shari'a. It resembles the deen. When you see Muslims doing that, you think that that's the sunnah. When you see them making prayer or dua, you think that that's sunnah. In other words, it's not but so far out. It's not but what? It resembles. It's something that when you see, it's a religious practice. And you know it's nothing from custom, but it's deen. It's what? Huh, Abdul Karim, what is it? It's deen. So let's break down this definition. Let's dissect it now. First and foremost, bid'ah only deals with the realms of what? Religion or customs? Primarily religion. Primarily religion. Because you can do whatever you want in your customs. As we just explained with regards to clothes. If you want to wear a blazer, a jacket, a suit, a hat, kufi, it's your own discretion. But the moment you say wearing a hat is ibadah, wearing a shamag is ibadah, wearing a kufi is ibadah, then you're going to go back to that definition. So it's something that you do in which you seek closeness to Allah, a lot of closeness. And then there is no delil for it in the kitab, in the sunnah. It's mukhtara, it's new. It's been brought into uh-huh, existence. So let's look at the salat al taraweeh Did the Prophet ﷺ offer taraweeh? Did he lead the companions in prayer at night? So therefore, from the door, it is impossible to say that taraweeh is a bid'ah. Period. There's no way it can be a bid'ah if there's a proof. Muhammad did it. It's from the sunnah. How many times did he do it? How many days? That's a different story. But he did what? He did it. In other words, if there is an act of worship that you intend to do specifically, you need a proof. As for something as a means, a bridge, a port between you and the ibadah, you don't need proof for it. Such as using this microphone. No intention of worshiping Allah through this microphone. I can talk to you like this. I can raise my voice. I can be born as long as my words get to you. The microphone is nothing but a mere instrument. So no one can come along and say using a microphone is a good guy. Right or wrong? Because it's not worship. I don't intend to worship Allah with a microphone. I intend to worship Allah by speaking. This is nothing but a means of my words traveling to you. Okay, so it's, it's crucial to understand the definition of bid'ah and what it applies to. That's in brief. So therefore, Salat al-Taraweeh is not a bid'ah, whereas the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prayed the Taraweeh, and he specifically told us the reason why he left off the Taraweeh. He says, I'm afraid that it will become obligatory upon you, and you won't have the ability to do it. Rahmah, going back to the Asal, the deen is based off of mercy. Okay, so therefore, that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is, is it best to pray in your home? There are some of the people of knowledge who hold the opinion that Salat al-Taraweeh should be offered in the house. And they base it off of the authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ صَلَاةِ الْمَرْءِ فِي بَيْتِهِ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةِ The hadith of Zayd ibn Arqam, radiallahu anhu, 
collected by Imam Abu Dawood and others, the best prayer that a man can make is in his home with exceptions to the congregational prayer. The best prayer to be made by a man and also a woman is in her home, except for the farida, the five prayers. So some of the people of knowledge, as Shaykh Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi rahimahullah explained in his notes on Sahih Bukhari, that some ulama say that the taraweeh and any other prayer should be made in your home. And there are other ulama who say rather the taraweeh, the janazah, this prayer and that prayer should be made out in congregation for the following reasons. One, the Prophet ﷺ did it in congregation, even for a short period of time. Two, because it shows the strength of the Muslims. It shows that Islam is alive and it's vibrant. You come to the masjid, it's packed, it's swollen, there's no space. The kuffar see the Muslims praying in the masjid. You look on the television, the satellite, you see Mecca, they're praying in taraweeh. It shows that there's Islam, there's deen. So some ulama they say anything that is outward, that is obvious, that is apparent, and shows the unity and the strength of the Muslims should be done. Everybody clear on this? Now, what did Umar radiallahu anhu say when he meant, or meant when he said what an excellent bid this says? We say he meant what a good thing you've done by reviving a forgotten sunnah. What an excellent idea it was for reviving the forgotten sunnah. Having all the Muslims pray behind one imam together in sync. Ni'mal bid'atu hadihi. What a good new thing that you've done. In other words, you've took something that's old and classic and you dusted it off and polished it and brought it back out for the people. He used the linguistic meaning of bid'ah. It was no precedent for it during the time of the companions, not the Prophet It was forgotten, it was left alone. So therefore those people who wish to use this hadith to say that there's good bid'ah in Islam... Yani is very sad. Let alone the other text from the Prophet Kullu bid'atin dalala. Every week the Prophet would say on the minbar, when there was no innovation, every innovation is misguidance. So therefore, Yani, that's like taking a spider's web and making it a house for, for a human being. That's weak. That's far. That's ba'id, jiddin. The Prophet said, I warned us from bid'ah, and you want to bring a vague general statement of Umar against the Prophet's statement? Even if it meant that. Even if it meant that. But it doesn't. But even if it did mean, mean that. It, what did Ibn Abbas anhum, I say? He said, What? He says, He says, I say to you, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says, and you tell me, Abu Bakr and Umar say? So during the time of the companions, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that they use this style. Now, one last thing I want to I'll mention before I move on. This is my understanding, my limited knowledge, and my belief with regards to bid'ah. The bid'ah in Islam is impermissible. And it's from the worst things, and from the major sins of Islam to commit an innovation. So therefore, under any circumstance that we promote, side, defend, join, partner, Make excuses for innovations or anybody or people of innovations. Anyone else who says other than this about me or anyone that I trust and respect, may Allah's curse be upon them. I mean, because that's, that's a lie. But the fork in the road is, what do you consider a bid'ah? The next fork in the road is, who do you consider to be an innovator or a person of innovation? If you say, Abu Hanif, he made a mistake, he did this, we advised him, Kathy, he's a person of innovation. I say he's not a person of innovation. He's from the people of the Sunnah. I traveled with the man. I ate with the man. I laughed with him. I cried with him. I debated and argued with him. Spent the night of his house. He came. What are you talking about? I don't know him personally. He's from the people of the Sunnah. If he made an error, that's one thing. But to say that he's an innovator because of a mistake or two or three or four, that is without a doubt pure ghulu. That's extreme and that's excessive. That's extreme and that's excessive. And if you take that methodology... Anyone who makes a mistake is an innovation. Then there lies no doubt. You have laid in the bed with the khawarij. You've, 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 you've laid down with the khawarij. Because any Muslim who makes an act of kufr, the automatically say, it's kafir. No details, no ins and outs. Maybe it was an excuse. Maybe he thought it was permissible. Maybe he was forgetful. Maybe, maybe, la, kafir, kafir. Just like that. He, he went to this masjid. He spoke here. He did his ah, mubtadi, ahlul bid'ah, hisbi. He's with them. He sides with them. He parts with them. 
As the Mashiach tells us in that this is tabdi' ukht al takfir. Declaring someone to be an innovator is similar to declaring someone to be a kafir. Because there are rulings of declaring someone to be an innovator. You don't give him salams, don't visit his great kada, his janazah, when he's sick, when he's ill, similar to a kafir. So you have to be careful. And that will lead you to calling your brother kafir. I'm not giving him salams. As a brother in Philadelphia, he says, she, that bleep bleep, he said, it's not my brother. He said, it's not my brother. So our brother said, Akhi, what do you mean by that? you making takfir? He said, no, no, no. No, he means that he's not my brother for the sunnah. Shaq, the first line in Sharh sunnah is that Islam is what? And as soon as Islam. Ain't that have a hadha? Where did that go? So therefore, as Shaykh Islam and I'm gonna close with this, he says, he said, what did Shaykh Islam and say? He said, Kullu man khalafa al tariqata al rabaniya al ilahiya al salafiya fala bud an yatanaqab. He says, everyone who goes against the divine, divine path of Allah Azza wa the path of the earliest Muslims, it is a must that he will contradict himself. In one place he affirms something, another place he negates the same exact thing. In one place he deals with the person A, B, C, and next place is A, B, C, D, E, N, F, and G. Because he went against the kitab and the sunnah. And that's not in the kitab and the sunnah what you're calling me to. That's not the kitab and the sunnah, nor is that the way of the people of the knowledge. Okay, the many of the ulama of the past, they made mistakes, they made errors. Now, all of this, Yehwan, is if we give you the argument, we give you the benefit of the doubt in saying that it was a mistake. Abu Hanif made a mistake, clearly. What if what Abu Hanif did was right, and what you're saying is wrong, but based off of your ignorance, you call it a mistake? Then what? What if Abu Hanif had proof, three, four hadiths, hadith, scholars, ulama, who said what he said? Is it correct to say he made mistakes, he has mistakes? What did Ibn Abdul Barr, rahimahullah ta'ala, say? La, it could be, it could be correct. We say that worse come to worse, who amin masail al ijtihad. It's from the affairs of ijtihad in which there's different ways of understanding and looking. And Ibn Abdul Barr, rahimahullah, he quoted from all of the ulama, la inkara fi masail al khilaf. There is no criticism in issues of khilaf. No criticism. Because you have your proof and your evidence. You have your way that you're going. I may not agree with it, but you have a proof and evidence. As for someone that's clearly against the proof, that's obstinate, that's arrogant, that's haughty, then that's one thing. Okay? So therefore we have to get rid of this excessiveness and this extremism that many of us unfortunately have been raised upon for years. And been taught that this is, that's not the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Abadan. That is not the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That is the way of this person and that person and this group and that group. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are the furthest of people from extremism and excessiveness. If somebody makes a mistake, it's a way in which you deal with it. If somebody says something that you don't agree with, it's a way of sitting down and talking and investigating. As for forcing yourself upon the next man, this and that, we advise them, we call them, that's not Ahlul Sunnah. That is the statement and the opinion of Fulan and Alan for man, for mankind. Khalas, period. No more. Let's move on. We mentioned on Wednesday, on Thursday, Uh, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhuma that said inna al-imana la yakhlaqu fi jawfi ahadikum kama yakhlaqu al-thawb fas'al Allah ta'ala an yujadid lakum al-iman aw kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hadith has been collected by Imam al-Hakim in his mustadrak and it declared to be sahih along with other scholars of hadith of the past that a man could become worn out and tattered in one of your hearts as a thaw becomes worn out and tattered. So ask Allah to renew your iman. Ask Allah to rejuvenate your iman. So we were explaining some of the statements of uh, a few of the companions and a few of the disciples from the tabi'een with regards to the importance of looking after one's iman. We quoted from Shaykh Abdul Razak, Havidullah Ta'ala, Shaykhuna, that the pious predecessors were so smart, so wise, they had such in-depth knowledge, they knew the most important thing to pay attention to and to study and to teach and to focus on was Iman. That, that was at the top of the list of important things. You have many other important things, but you have something which is most important. And that was Iman. Tayyip, everybody with me? Everybody with me? So therefore, what we want to talk about now is some of the reasons behind one's Iman increasing. We mentioned a few of them in brief the other day. Now we want to go into detail. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ خَيْرًا إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ 
what are some of the reasons behind a person's demand increasing? And I believe there was a homework assignment we had. We had a homework assignment to find the proof that demand increases and decreases. He's not here. Allah Akbar. Hadith. Hadathana la akhbarana. Uh, no, I didn't, huh? Tell you, what was the, who, who did we give the assignment to? We gave someone this assignment. Khalil, all right? <laughs> Wasn't you? <laughs> Allah Akbar. Khair, inshallah. Tell you. Okay, who can be kind enough, bin Allah, to tell me one of the reasons behind a person's iman increasing? Alameen. Khalifa. Abdul Rashid. How can we increase any man? We raise the right hand or the left hand? Abu Ma'ad, Fadl. Being kind to your brothers is the reason behind your iman increasing. Tai, do we have any proof for this? Abdullah. Do we have any proof for that? Sent. He nailed the huh right on the head, but get rid of that translation. Truly believes. He said, obviously, she had that. Get rid of that. None of you believes. La yu'minu ahadukum. None of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Ahsent. It clearly shows us that Iman has been negated. The Messenger of Allah, what? He nefal Iman. He negated Iman. La yu'min. That's negation. Hatta until so on and so forth. In other words, until you do so on and so forth, your iman has been negated. And if it's been negated, it is proven that you've left off something that is obligatory from iman. Something that is wajib from iman. It is obligatory to love for your brother what you love for yourself. Ahsant. Does this mean that the one who doesn't love for his brother what he loves for himself is a non-Muslim? Does it mean that? What is the proof that it doesn't mean that? The Prophet says, La yutmin. And you're telling me, yutmin. He does believe. You have to bring him proof for that. It has to be a delil to say that this hadith doesn't mean that. Because the hadith clearly states what? La yu'min. Does not believe. So you have to bring me a proof stating that it means something else. It's an easy, it's an easy question. Easy. You're thinking too hard. It's easy. It's simple. Think about a story between one of the companions. Think about a husband and a wife. If a husband is oppressive to his wife, what is the solution? If a husband doesn't give his right, his wife her rights, what's the solution? What's the solution? Divorce. Seek divorce? Sorry. <laughs> Philly. Allah Akbar. Lash out. That's silly. No doubt. That's deep. Sorry. <laughs> Ask the question again. If a husband doesn't give his wife her rights, What's the solution? Give her her rights. Give her her rights. How? How how is she to get her rights from him? By doing what? Ask Allah. Ask Allah first. Right, good. Then what else? Counseling, admonishing him, saying, fear Allah, kada wa kada. Sahih? Right. If he was an apostate, if he left Islam, would there be any benefit in advising him and getting counseling? It wouldn't be. So, by him not giving her her rights, that means he doesn't want for her what he wants for himself. Because he wants all of his rights. All of them. But he doesn't give the rights that she has over him. So that means he left off something that was wajib. He did not leave Islam. He's still in the fold of Islam. In other words, his iman did what? It decreased. But it still was in the boundaries of? Of Islam, of iman. That's the proof. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi whenever the companions would go to him and they would complain about their husbands, they beat us. He doesn't give me this. He, do, he prays too much at night. He doesn't give me my rights. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi say they have left Islam, let them say Shahada again? He didn't say that. In other words, they left off something which was obligatory, but they did not leave. They didn't leave Iman. Everybody understand this? Everybody with me here? This is a delil. All right, let's, let's, let's bring another proof. Tayyip. Tayyip. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says... The Prophet says, type, Amen. Not what do you want your brother, what you want for yourself. Okay? 
How many hadith did the Prophet ﷺ admonish the companions to be just in what they do, to be honest, to speak the truth in their transactions? He said, I know that one of you is telling a lie. One of you is telling the truth, someone isn't telling the truth. Did he tell them to come back to Islam? He didn't tell them that they've left the fold of Islam. In other words, that means what they did was haram, but they still remained upon what? Upon Iman. Upon what? Upon Iman. So that is a proof that Iman, loving for your brother what you want for yourself, is what is the reason behind Iman growing. Because if you don't do it, the Prophet ﷺ says, you don't have Iman. And the Prophet's statement, you don't have Iman, doesn't mean that you've left the fold of Islam with another proof that there were companions who did things to each other, who had interactions and dealings, and which one of them complained, and he didn't, they did not leave the fold of Islam. Khair, number two, Khalifa. A proof that your Iman, or something that will make your Iman grow and increase. Hold on. Tahajjud, praying at night. Khair, inshallah. Proof, delil. That praying at night makes your Iman grow. What does Allah say in the Quran? You will not lend tanalul birra hatta tunfiku mimma tuhibun. Allah says, You will never achieve piety until you spin of that which you love. Do you not love sleep? Everybody loves to sleep, one way or another. You sacrifice sleep to pray for Allah, that you love Allah more than your sleep. You have achieved what? Piety. And from the names of Iman and Taqwa is synonymous terms. Tayyip. يقول ابن رجب معرفا بهذا بهذا العلم فالعلم النافع هو ضبط نصوص الكتاب والسنة وفهم معانيها وتقيد في ذلك بالمأثور عن الصحابة والتابعين وتابعيهم في معاني القرآن والحديث وفيما ورد عنهم من الكلام في مسائل الحلال والحرام والزهد والرقائق والمعارف وغير ذلك والاجتهاد على تمييز صحيحه من سقيمه أولا ثم الاجتهاد على الوقوف على معانيه وتفهمه ثانيا وفي ذلك كفاية لمن عقل وشغل لمن بالعلم النافع عني واشتغل ابن رجب الحنبلي may Allah have mercy upon him says beneficial knowledge pay close attention to these words he says beneficial knowledge is having a proper understanding of the text of the book and the sunnah. That's beneficial knowledge. From the reasons behind your iman increasing, number one has to be learning beneficial knowledge. Prayer, tahajjud, for your brother, so on and so forth. The first step in increasing and growing in iman is having more knowledge that is beneficial. What is beneficial knowledge? What do ulama say? Is that beneficial knowledge? What's in the masjid? What's in the book? Ibn Rajab said, beneficial knowledge is that which is based off of the kitab and the sunnah. He says, in sticking to the proper understanding of the kitab and the sunnah, of what has been narrated from the companions and the tabi'een and their followers, and the meanings of hadith and those verses in the Qur'an. And listen, listen carefully. He says, and what they have said about halal, about haram, about zuhd, Abstaining from pleasures of the worldly life and about heart softening things and in-depth knowledge. In other words, in simple terms, the way of the companions and the pious predecessors is Islam. Everything about Islam, permissible, impermissible, tawheed, shirk, dunya, zuhd, dhikr, kamil. The way of the companions is not attached to one sphere of the religion, but it's the entire deen. He then says, and then working hard to determine that which is authentic from that which is inauthentic first. In other words, the science of what? Abu Sa'id. And al hadith. Science of hadith is vital in your application to Islam. If you don't know which is authentic from that which is weak, how can you implement that which is authentic and avoid that which is weak? He then says, ثُمَّ الْإِجْتِهَادُ al الْوَقُوفِ Understanding that authentic information. And he says, and those who wish to stay busy, this is more than enough work for them. That's more than enough to keep you busy, to keep your time full. Learn the kitab and the sunnah, listen and read what the companion said, and determine and decipher that which is authentic from that which is inauthentic. وَقَالَ بْنُ حَجَرُ وَالْمُرَادُ بِالْعِلْمِ الشَّرْعِي الَّذِي يُفِيدُ مَا يَجِبُ عَلَى الْمُكَلَّفِ مِنْ أَمْرِ دِينِهِ فِي عِبَادَتِهِ وَمُعَامَلَاتِهِ وَالْعِلْمِ بِاللَّهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ 
ما يجب له من القيام بأمره وتنزيه عن النقاس ومدار ذلك على التفسير والحديث والفقه Hafid ibn Hajar he says what's meant by knowledge shar'i religious knowledge is that which the slave must know with regards to his religion in other words the basics of your deen you have to be fundamentally sound before you wish to move on to further aspects of knowledge if you're not fundamentally sound as teacher Tariq said out there in the in the yard he says when you're shooting the bow your discipline from a short range is going to continue and carry on when you go to a what further distance if you're not fundamentally sound from 20 yards it's impossible to hit the mark from 40 or 60 yards and that is the same concept in Islam that all of us have to be fundamentally sound the basics of salat you have to know from a to z the basics of wudu you must know the ins and outs of them the basics of paying zakah of buying and selling you must know no one is excused from learning the basics. Now, the extra things, the khilaf, the third opinion, the second proof, the third proof, that is a fadl, that's a fadila. That's a virtue for the people who want to go overseas and want to learn those things. He then says, the anchor of all of this, summarizing his kalam, listen carefully. The three tiers, I'm going to leave you with this. The three tiers of beneficial knowledge, Ibn Hajar says, is tafsir of the Qur'an, hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and fiqh. Oh, student of knowledge, once you go overseas, you learn the basic Arabic language, you learn the basics of Naho and Sarf, and you learn the usul al-fiqh, the legal theory, the basics of hadith science, focus on these three points. Tafsir of the Qur'an, this book, this lecture, how many times have you read Ibn Kathir? How many times have you studied Ibn Kathir? Tafsir, hadith, how many times have you read Imam Nawi's 40 hadith? The explanation of those 40 hadith. Samar al-Sayyid Bukhari, Bulug Maram, Umdu al-Hakam. He says, and fiqh. Before you go into the khilaf, before you go into fatawa, before you go into other spheres and other aspects of the deen, these are your three focal points. Tafsir, hadith, and fiqh. In other words, in tafsir and hadith, you're going to find aqidah. You're going to find tawheed. You're going to find everything about iman and ghayb and angels and last day. Because the sources for that belief is where? Kitab and the Sunnah. So it only makes sense to focus on the explanation of the Kitab and the Sunnah. And then for your everyday worship, comes into play fiqh. The second thing that Shaykh Abdul Razak, uh, Hafidullah Ta'ala, mentions with regards to uh, reasons behind increasing in Iman, he says, is reflecting upon Allah's creation and thirdly performing an abundant amount of righteous deeds. We're going to stop here. Bidnillah Azawajal before Salat al Maghrib. Maybe somebody has some comments, some corrections. Some questions, something that you want to say on the lecture. Now is the time, and if not, alhamdulillah, I will stop. Any questions from the sisters from up the steps like earlier? Let them send them down now, please, inshallah. And if not, we'll stop. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Question says, if someone is wearing a silk suit, is their prayer invalid? We say, according to the majority of the fuqaha, most of the uh, jurists, and the doctors of fiqh of the past, most of them said that the prayer is invalid. They said that their prayer is invalid. And there's some of the ulama of past and of present who said that the prayer is valid, but they remain sinful from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the correct opinion. Whereas the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prohibiting the men of the nation, of this nation, of this ummah, nation of Islam, <laughs> Nah, la best, the nation of Islam, ummah to Islam. But not the nation of Islam. Tayyip? Huh? If you make a statement, and if it's a correct statement, that's okay. Now, what you meant is a secondary. But that in itself, Abu Bakr, Halal, Sahih? Nation of Islam. Is that a. How do mean a deen? Nation of Islam. Okay? Just like it's also to say brotherhood, Muslim brotherhood. That's from the deen. Allah called us Ikhwan. Now, do you mean this group, this political party? That's not what we're talking about. That's not what? What we're talking about. Allah says, بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ Allah says, O oh Messenger, بَلِّغْ Make tabligh of that which Allah has sent down to you. So if I say, I'm going to make tabligh. So I say, ah, jamaat tabligh ah, bid'ah, la, 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 ya khi. The, the wording is valid. The intention is secondary. So therefore we say, Ikhwan, that the nation of Islam, the Muslims, the Muslim men, who say, La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, the Prophet ﷺ, he forbade them from wearing silk. 
Alaikum And when he made that prohibition, Akhi, everybody stay with me. Food is a distraction. Food is a distraction. Tayyip. Knowledge cannot be obtained by relaxation of the body. Yahya ibn Abi Kathir said, Abdullah, in your library in Medina, Yahya, you need to put that on your wall. That should be your slogan. La yunalu al-ilm bi rahat al-jism. Knowledge is not obtained by relaxation of the body. In other words, we say no pain, no gain. That's the slogan of the student of knowledge. So some hunger is a must. The Prophet Wasallam he did not mention that hadith talking about prayer. In other words, it's haram to wear silk in the prayer and outside the prayer. If it's not specifically talking about prayer, then we cannot say that the prayer is invalid. But we say that you are sinful. If you made wudu with water that was stolen. If you prayed in someone's house that you stole. Someone that you robbed. Your prayer is valid if you did the rest of the obligatory acts and avoided the rest of the impermissible acts or invalidators of prayer. And your sin is upon your own soul. And Allah knows best. Question says, Bismillah, Bismihi ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. Considering that we are told in the Quran to, to not walk through the earth with much pride and in the sunnah to refrain from arrogance even in our dress. What is your advice concerning uh, types of clothing that suggest something about being Muslim and slogans that announce our superiority non-Muslims? Uh, I would say that there has to be a balance in Islam. Allah says, do not walk with arrogance, do not walk with conceit. And Allah also tells us to adorn ourselves in the Quran. Allah sent down upon us, libas of taqwa, clothing of piety, warisha, and adornment. So therefore, the Muslim has to adorn him or herself with that which is permissible. But at the same time, not to be arrogant and not to be prideful. Uh, and there's no direct relation between having some nice clothes and pride and arrogance. Extravagant clothes, really expensive clothes or car, that's a different story. But nice, there's nothing wrong with nice. Having nice stuff and arrogance is not directly connected. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he was asked, he says, Ar-rajulu. He says, the man, يُحِبُّ أَنْ يَكُونَ ثَوْبُهُ حَسَنًا a man loves to have a nice clothes. He likes to have nice sandals. Is that from pride? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Pride is rejecting the truth and scorning the people. That's the definition of pride. When you hear the truth, you don't want to hear the truth. And you look down upon the people and you're being better than the people. So therefore, there's nothing wrong with having nice clothes, nothing wrong with wearing nice shoes, nothing wrong with driving a, ni- driving a nice automobile. As for that which is beyond nice, that which is expensive and extravagant, we cannot say that that's haram, and it all depends on the person, brothers and sisters. Please, everybody pay attention. This is a very important concept. It's a very important concept. If you have the means to wear a Rolex watch, it's not out of your budget. You're not sacrificing your other responsibilities. You're paying your zakah. You're giving sadaqah. Your wife, your children are fed well. They're taken care of. You support fi sabilillah. And Allah is giving you abundance of wealth. There's nothing wrong with having a Rolex watch or a or any other type of watch that you want to wear. As for, if you can afford a Rolex watch, but it's out of your means, somebody with your type of job doesn't wear that type of Rolex, then that's a different story. There lies no doubt a king, a president, a mayor of a country, he can't go around walking a, a Casio water-resistant watch. The people are going to look down upon him. They're going to call him cheap and stingy. They're going to call him a miser. You go to meet the delegates of this country and this state, and you're having a plastic watch? It's disrespectful, without a doubt. It's disrespectful. And that can also fall into that which they call libas al-shuhra, clothing of fame. That which you wear to get a reputation. That which you wear to get a reputation. Ah, he's a zahid. Look, he got zuhd. Look what he wears. Look what he drives. He lives in a shack. And he has millions of dollars. La, 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 la. So it's a difference. If you have that, alhamdulillah. If you don't have that, you're going out of your boundaries, then you can fall into being extravagant. You're falling to being a traveler. Ask for if you find a Rolex at a good price. Alhamdulillah. But we're talking about buying a brand new, diamond studded, so on and so forth. And you're barely paying rent. The masjid in your community is a tiny hole in the wall masjid. Your children go to school without everything they need. That's a different story. And Allah knows best. I would advise you, sister, and all of the brothers to go back a book. Uh, Alhamdulillah, that was translated and published some years ago. Titled, 
um, a warning from extravagance. Okay? A warning from extravagance. So something similar to this title by Sheikh Abdulaziz ibn Abdullah ibn Baz. Uh, we translated the book some years back. The Sheikh gave an entire lecture on this topic. And he mentioned the do's and the don'ts with regards to being extravagant and be, being a spendthrift and being cheap. To avoid both of them and to be in the middle. Inshallah, go back to that book. You can find all the information that you need. Allah knows best. Like logos, jerseys. To non-Muslims. Superiority. Type. Uh, me personally, um, for a person to have a, a shirt that says, I'm a Muslim, something from Islam... My personal opinion, I'm not saying this is Allah's deen, my personal opinion, I don't say anything wrong with that. I don't say any prohibition in the kitab and the sunnah with regards to that. As for something that is derogatory to other people, so on and so forth, then that's, that, that's a different story. But to say you're Muslim, alhamdulillah, la ilaha Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, uh, miskeen, sahaba, this, that, la bas. As for logos and jerseys and things like this, and images and true religion and so on and so forth, that's a whole different issue that we're not going to get into right now. Is it permissible for a Muslim to wear a jersey? Can you walk around with a non-Muslim's name on your back? We're not going to get into that. Is it permissible to have a rhino on your shirt or a Buddha playing a guitar on your pants or this and that, a horse or a moose? Allahu alam. We're not going to get into that right now. Allah knows best. Na'am Abdul Salam. Question says, putting the Qur'an on their shirts. Taya. The Qur'an, brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, we have among us, MashaAllah, a good friend, friend for many years, who's shy and bashful. May Allah increase him and raise him higher. We have Abu Zaina, Ali Davis. Uh, the man, uh, Talib, bear witness, I'm not exaggerating. We would travel, make Hajj and Umrah, and what we say? We have to go see to debate and to increase the knowledge and the practice and to sharpen our skills. Him and Abu Sajid, and there was another, but Allahu Musta'an. Tayyip. Uh, moving on. We say that Yani and Al Islam. Tayyip, move on to the next question. <laughs> move on to the next question. We say what, hey, Juan, that putting the Quran on your shirt. Can you put the Quran on your shirt, Abdul Salam? I thought the Quran, the Quran is a lost speech. A picture of the Mus'haf? A picture of the Mus'haf on your shirt. I understand what he's saying. Lazim nusahi al ibara. Say, al ibara al khati'a to sahah. Statements that are not the most correct have to be fixed. We say that the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it's recited, when someone hears it, when it's written down. As for the one Quran is put on top of put on paper with ink between two covers, then we call it the Mus'haf Sharif. So if a person has a picture of a page out of the Mus'haf and they put it on the shirt, um, going in the bathroom, I wouldn't say that it's haram, whereas there's no direct proof in the Kitab and the Sunnah to state that, but it's definitely yani best to avoid. Many of the people of the past, the ulama, they say that it's disliked to enter into the hammam, anything that has Allah's name on it. Anything with Allah's name on it, it is disliked to enter into the hammam. should be avoided out of respect for Allah's deen, out of respect for the religion of Al-Islam. To say it's impermissible, Allahu Alam. Any other questions before we stop? Follow. Ali, get a chair, ya akhi. Yalla, ta'al. So we can benefit from you, inshallah. Abdullah, fadl. لا 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 ونبيك الذي أرسلت لا لا it's not what we say أحسنت and فق أيوة we gotta be hard on you Abdullah you student of knowledge Abdullah Hamdullah is in Islamic University of Medina فضل so we gotta be strict حديث تفسير حديث and فق not the opposite فضل For someone who doesn't have the time to learn Arabic, 
Should they learn those three things? Ah, Ahlon Salon, Abuanis. I'm putting down the microphone, man. Too many people in here for me to be talking. Yeah, Imam, please don't force me, Sheikh. Al Muhim, Yani, from the etiquettes of a student of knowledge, as we said before, is he shouldn't he shouldn't speak in the presence of someone who's more knowledgeable. Someone who's older than him, better than him, he shouldn't speak in their presence. So we're gonna stop here. If those brothers, alhamdulillah, we have several tulab al ilm, alhamdulillah, jihad in the house, they can finish if they like, and if not, I wanna stop here, alhamdulillah. And Allah knows better.